Welcome and aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea from Chicago and South Bend to Tokyo and Seoul and ultimately to Hawaii and talk with Hawaii attorney Stephen Dyer about his journeys in Japanese language and culture, the practice of law, and service in the U.S. Army. And how all these roads connected and ultimately converged in his personal and professional lives. Welcome, Steve. How are you? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be here. Okay, we're 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 looking at a beautiful photo of you uh, that appears on your website page of your law firm. What law firm is that, by the way? It's Chong Nishimoto, Sia, Nakamura, and Goya. Okay, all right. Now, but before we get into your law practice and talk about that, tell me a little bit about your background, your personal background, where you're from, uh, where you grew up, and then I know you went to Notre Dame uh, undergrad and uh, John Marshall Law School, but try to just give me a little background on yourself. That's correct, Mark. Mark, I grew up in... Uh just outside Chicago, a town called Joliet, Illinois. Uh, I did my time, um, figuratively. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a um, town that's known for a prison, yes, yeah, okay. A couple of them, correct. Um, you know, I, I went to Joliet Catholic High School, all boys, and uh, my, my dad was a uh, an army uh, in World War II. He was a an infantry company commander with the 36th Infantry Division that went from all the way up Italy into southern France. Um, and I, I was kind of into high school. I didn't really worry about college. And one day he comes up uh, and he goes, so what are you going to do next year? I go, oh, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. He goes, are you going to go to college? This is my senior year in high school. <laughs> And I go, yeah, I guess so. And he goes, well, how are you going to pay for it? Uh, and I look at him, and he goes, it's not going to be me, so you better start applying for scholarships. And he had gone and filled out uh, a scholarship application for an Army ROTC scholarship. And he goes, you just have to write an essay and sign it, and I'll send it in for you. I go, what's ROTC? <laughs> he explained it to me. And I thought, oh, okay, I get it. He's an ex-officer, so... Okay, I'll sign it. And so, bottom line is, I got the scholarship. And uh, it was funny. I had applied to Notre Dame and gone up for an interview. And uh, the admissions counselor is like, "Well, oh, you know, we haven't reviewed your your application yet. But have you applied to other schools?" I go, "Okay, I get it." Um, and then I, the next week, I, I was informed I got the scholarship, and uh, this Army colonel had called me, and I told him the story of this admissions counselor. He goes, oh, really? I'll call you right back. <laughs> and he calls in 15 minutes. He goes, guess what? You've been accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so that worked out okay. Um, uh, and then at Notre Dame freshman year, all the freshmen have to take the same core courses, five courses. It's how they weed you out. And uh, one of the courses is a modern language. So I had taken Latin and French in high school, three years each, and I figured, eh, I'll take French too. I'll get my C and kind of cruise, and that'll be it. And sure enough, after the first semester, I got my C, but then second semester, the first week, I didn't prepare. Um, and the French prof took me Friday afternoon after class. He goes, uh, Monsieur Dyer, uh, you were not prepared today. I go, no, but I'll do better on Monday. He goes, no, no, no. If you come Monday, I will flunk you. You better go to the dean because I know you need a language or else you're out. I thought, that's pretty harsh. But I went to the dean. <laughs> the dean goes, oh, Dyer, I took the liberty of calling the French, uh, the, the Spanish prof, the German prof, the Russian prof. Nobody wants you. Um, you'd have to make up a whole semester in a week. And anyway, um, oh, hold on, the phone's ringing. And he hangs up and he goes, that was the Japanese prof. You need three students to have a class at Notre Dame or else they canceled the class and he just lost his third student. So you're gonna go over there and be his third student. You better pass Dyer or else you're gone. <laughs> so fear is a great motivator, Mark. I. Uh, 
I studied very hard. So I think that was actually a guardian angel in disguise taking care of me because uh, he, he recommended the prof did that. Uh, he says, yeah, you, you've not only caught up, but I want you to go study in, in Tokyo your sophomore year, and I did. And then I wound up uh, majoring in Japanese along with economics. And, uh, at, at Notre Dame. But I, yeah. yeah there, but, so there, there, you had a kind of a dual major, is that it, at Notre Dame? I had a double major, correct. And Notre Dame has a program that are somehow you were got to Japan as an undergraduate, is that, is that correct? Correct, at Sophia University, yeah. which I believe you went to, yeah, Mark? Yeah, I went to as an undergraduate also for a year, yeah. But you, you were there for two years, so, is that correct? Or? No, I was at Sophia for just one year, but actually nine months. Okay. Um, but then during law school, hmm, okay. so, I was, you know, I owed the Army four years since they paid for four years of undergrad. Because you got a scholarship and, to uh, attend Notre Dame through the, the, the ROTC program. Correct. Okay. And, then, and so I was able to get, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. And then, and then because of this, this fluke in this language is what got you hooked on Japan, I guess, where you had to take the language. Yeah. Okay. And right. so, so in law school, I, I was I, able to get a... Well, I was able to get a, an educational delay, they call it a deferment of the, the Army commitment for three years for law school, but then I, I received a, a rotary, you've heard of you know rotary clubs, a rotary international uh, ambassadorial fellowship to go study at a Japanese law school, um, along with a preparatory 15-month period of only intensive Japanese to get to a law school level. Um, and then they sent me to Chuo University Law School, which is the largest law school in Japan. <laughs> that was not easy. But um, so I did actually a five year, took me five years to get through law school, but um, I, I learned Japanese, so it worked out great. And, and because of the uh, tours in Japan as an undergraduate in Notre Dame, and then ultimately in, in John Marshall Law School, because of that scholarship. Now, I, I didn't know they had scholarships or, or um, programs in law school like that. That's, pr that's pretty cool. That's pretty nice. But ultimately, that's how you gained your knowledge of Japan language and culture, uh, this uh, boy from uh, Illinois. Yeah, who, who knew? <laughs> and, and it's all the <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go figure. Yeah, kind of so, so, and, and, uh, as I understand it, uh, all of these things kind of played into an interest that you had, and, the, and you, you got hooked, not only on, on uh, Japan, but on the law and uh, military. And, uh, I mean, what, what in your background uh, directed you to that area, to those areas, to those roads? So that was journey. Yeah, so that's, no, I'm sorry, that's very perceptive of you, Mark, exactly. Um, you know, I was adopted at birth, uh, and I couldn't have been blessed with two finer parents. They were magnificent. Um, I love them greatly. Um, but the Army, uh, when I finished law school, the Army, of course, said, where do you want to go? I go, well, how many, you know, I was going to be a, a JAG officer in the in the legal system. And I go, how many JAGs you have are fluent in Japanese? They go, yeah, good point. And so the next week I got my orders for Korea, yeah, kind of typical army. <laughs> and uh, But that worked out because if you know Japanese, I was able to learn Korean pretty well. So I can get around in Korean too. Um, and then after Korea, they sent me here to Hawaii. And I became Tripler's uh, medical claims judge advocate. So I did all their medical malpractice defense. And one day during that time, I showed up with chest pains one morning, and you know I was kind of concerned. And you know you get to know the chiefs of all the services, so I called uh, my friend, the chief of cardiology, who said, "Get you know get up here right now." And he asked me what my family history was for heart disease, and I go, uh, "I don't know. I'm an adoptee." So he goes, "You better track them down." So I did. Uh, it took five years, and in the meantime, I got out of the Army and started private practice here. But uh, 
the, the adoption folks, Catholic Charities, called me and says, well, we have good news and bad news for you. The bad news is your mother passed away, your birth mother, um, but she had a sister, and the sister lives in Honolulu. <laughs> so wow. within an hour, that sister was in my conference room, and we're, you know, I'm looking at photos and finding out things. Uh, they, in turn, hooked me up with my birth father, and... Uh, the weird thing was I, I found out my, my birth father told me, yeah, you're from a long line. We have a genealogy that goes back to 1254 in England. You're from a long line of lawyers and military officers. Wow. And we're all linguists. Amazing. Oh, so my gosh. It, it kind of all made sense. <laughs> it's like uh, some uh, invisible hand is moving the uh, pieces on the chessboard so that yeah, all these things come up because I mean, but for the army, you you wouldn't uh, be in Hawaii. Uh, but for working at Tripler through the army, you wouldn't have found your parents basically because uh, you know you went to the doctor and he gave you that advice, and then and then you find out this long long history, uh, and 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 you're you have a relative right in Honolulu. I mean, it's kind of how do these things happen? Well, and not only that, but the weird thing is uh, my auntie who lives in Honolulu here <laughs> tells me that her father, so my birth grandfather, is a 1923 Notre Dame grad. Okay. So maybe that was my guardian angel when I got kicked out of French. Who knows? <laughs> okay, so uh, in, in the Army, when you were in Korea, what kind of cases were you handling? Uh, they put me in what's called the Trial Defense Service, and I was there 27 months. I did 27 jury trials, court martials, uh, so it was defending soldiers who'd been accused of crimes, so all criminal defense. And all trial practice, basically. Correct. Yeah. And Very good experience. Yeah, and that kind of set, set you up, I suppose, for what you're doing now? Is that what your practice is now uh, at your law firm? Sort of. I still, I'm still a trial lawyer. I'd like to think so anyway. I'm a litigator. Um, but I don't do criminal anymore. I do all civil. So lawsuits, I, I defend mostly. Some plaintiffs work too. Uh, mostly actually for Japanese plaintiffs who don't understand English well enough. I, I'll represent them. Uh, as well as military folks. Those are kind of, you know, the soft spots in my heart. But uh, mostly defense, yes. Okay, so you... Uh studied Japanese, you learned uh, about the culture because you spent a number of years as an undergraduate and law student there, and uh, you had a military background uh, also in, in Asia, and then ultimately uh, you came back here to Hawaii, and Hawaii's your home now, is that, is that, is that where you're, you're, you're staying and working and living? Absolutely. Um, I, I fell in love with Hawaii when I came here in 1988, so I've been here, what, however long that is. Um, yeah. Um, and, and you know, it didn't hurt. Go ahead. And, and look, I want to take a minute break right now, and then I want to talk about the convergence of all those roads of military, law, and Japan when we come back. Uh, an interesting incident. So I'd like to talk about that. We'll take a break and be right back. Aloha. I'm Dalen Yanagita, one of our hosts of our Business in Hawaii talk show on the Think Tech Hawaii. The theme of Business in Hawaii is to share with you stories of local businesses by local people. And our guests share with us their journey to building a successful business right here at home. We are streamed live on Think Tech weekly at 2 p.m. on Thursdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. I am Dalen Yanagita, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Aloha, I'm Lillian Kumi, host of Lillian's Vegan World, the show where we talk about veganism and the plant-based diet located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a vegan chef and cooking instructor, and I have lots of uh, information to share with you about how awesome this plant-based diet is. So do tune in every second Thursday from 1 p.m. Aloha. Aloha, we are back, 
Uh, I am Mark Schlav, interviewing Stephen Dyer. Stephen is a Hawaii lawyer, and he's had um, several interesting roads that he's walked down uh, from studying Japanese language and culture at Notre Dame and John Marshall Law School, or, or through programs offered by those schools, becoming a military officer in the JAG Corps, and ultimately coming to Hawaii. And, and Stephen, uh, how do you explain all these roads converged and on February 9th, 2001, something happened. You got a phone call. What was that about? Yeah, you know, everybody wants to be the right guy in the right place at the right time, I think. And everybody will have that moment. And and I think I was accorded that moment on that date uh, that evening. Um, I went home and uh, I got a phone call from the staff judge advocate, in other words, the chief lawyer for Pacific Command, which is the four-star command up at Camp Smith. Um, for those who don't know, Camp Smith, the four-star at Camp Smith is it's a joint command, and the four-star is in charge of all U.S. military assets from California to India. So it's essentially two-thirds of the planet's surface. It's the most powerful and largest military command in the history of the planet. Um, I was fortunate enough when I got off active duty, um, the JAG office up there needed a reservist. Um, so I was a reservist at Pacific Command for, geez, 17 years. Uh, it was a very fulfilling experience being a reservist up there, being able to speak Japanese, Korean, and be able to be, be sent all over Asia and kind of have a knowledge of, of Asia. Although, funny, um, PACOM sent me just about everywhere but Japan and Korea, <laughs> mostly Thailand and Vietnam and Australia, New Zealand, uh, Malaysia, but it worked out fine. But on that evening, I got a phone call. There, this is probably the one big occasion when I was able to utilize my Japanese and my experience in Japan. Um, there had been a horrible accident. Uh, I'm sure listeners, uh, if you're older than 25, have heard of the Ehime Maru incident where a Japanese, uh, kind of a fishing trawler, but an educational vessel that the prefecture of Ehime, which is in the Shikoku island of Japan, commissioned to teach high school kids to be fishermen. So kind of a tech uh, center vessel. And it had docked in Hawaii for a few days and it was leaving here and it was about six, seven miles offshore when one of our Navy subs, the Greenville, uh, did uh, a maneuver called an emergency blow where they pretty much go straight up and kind of breach you know, like a whale would breach out of water. And uh, they didn't check to see if anything was up there. They figured middle of the ocean, what's going to be there? And they struck the the, the, the the fishing vessel, and they cut it in half, and it began to sink immediately. Mm -hmm. And nine of the crew and, and students uh, were lost at sea, were killed. So you were yeah, very sad, very uh, tragic. You, so you were brought in to help, I guess, with the di the diplomacy, and because they knew of your background. And what did you do? Correct. So uh, the staff judge advocate called and said, "Hey, Steve, can you help us out? You know, we know you you speak Japanese, and you know you have a history living in Japan. Um, can you please help out? Plus, you're a lawyer; that won't hurt." Um, so I was the first representative of Pacific Command or anybody other than the Coast Guard who fished these guys out of the water that night um, to visit them. And uh, I introduced myself to the captain and, uh, you know, his crew and uh, to find out what happened and to find out what their needs were and tried to help them, you know, accomplish their, their needs. First of all, they were at Sand Island in the Coast Guard facility there. In fact, 
they had to throw them in the brig because they had no other room. And they lost all their clothes. And so they gave them prisoner jumpsuits. They're all wearing these orange jumpsuits for the brig. Uh, I kind of felt sorry for them. And frankly, they were just in shock still, I think. And uh, I was able to report back to Pacific Command, you know, their version of events. And uh, Pacific Command was still interviewing on their side too to find out what happened with the with the submarine folks but uh i was able to convince them to give them what's called salatia in international law uh that's just money so that they can you know get phone cards to call home to tell their loved ones they're okay and to, to go out and buy some clothes that they could get some clothes with because they lost everything right. so they told me hey just give the the, the captain a check and I go oh, you can't do that you got to do it the Japanese way you got to you know have some sensitivity here and I was able to convince the finance officer to contact the banker to get you know crisp brand new $100 bills uh, and put them in envelopes for each of the survivors there were 35 of them and have each of the envelopes inscribed in kanji with their name so, you know, to make them feel more comfortable, so frankly. The, the cultural way to progress, and that's based on your background in, in Japan and what you learned there. Uh, it was. It's all about doing the right thing. And, you know, you just right have to take care of these that. folks. <laughs> yeah. Doing yeah. the right thing is good. That's a Japanese uh, uh, cultural concept, too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then. So, what, hap what else happened uh, in that? Well. Uh, that was a Friday night, and then Saturday I got the cash, and by Saturday evening, 24 hours later, the facts had been sorted out, and it was clear that it was our fault. And in the meantime, you know, the, the TV network, CNN, was rife with reports of, you know, <laughs> the Japan-U.S. relationship going down the tubes, basically. And so I asked permission to apologize to the captain and crew when I handed over the, the Salacia uh, cash, and I was granted that permission. And how, did, how did you know to do that? I mean, that's an interesting cultural idea also. Well, I was fortunate that I had, I had called the interpreter who I'd been using for many years to help out. She's Japanese. Her name is Yasuko Kawakami. She was a huge help. Um, but also, I had gotten a black belt in the martial art of Iaido. Uh, Iaido is the, the samurai sword. And I think half the time when you learn Iaido, you're in the seiza position and you learn the ritual actions of, you know, bowing and apologizing. It's all about being humble. And um, so I utilized that training when I conveyed the, the checks, or not the checks, the cash, and, you know, apologized to each one. Um, it, it really came in handy. I think it made a, a big difference in trying to make lemonade out of this lemon. Yeah, and I believe that, you know, you've been complimented about that also by uh, superiors. Is that correct? About the way you handled it? Well, uh, you know, I hope I just did the right thing. I was just doing my job. Um, they did give me a, a medal afterwards, but no big deal. Uh, you know, I was just doing my job. Uh, like I said, being the right guy in the right place at the right time, I think. Okay, well, it, it looks like actually... You've been in the right place at the right time, maybe without knowing it, all your life, because uh, all these things seem to work out uh, and point you down the road in, in, in a direction where all of these concepts converged. Uh, Japan, uh, culture and language, uh, military and law put you in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I've been fortunate. There's a guardian angel somewhere out there. What, what have you, I mean, what, what can you tell us? What have you learned from all this? So we have a, about three minutes left in our program. What, what have you learned? What have you learned from all of this? Yeah, you know, I, I think I've stated it, but it's just doing the right thing. Um, 
you know, as attorneys, Mark, you're an attorney, so you know, we're par- we're problem solvers, and you have to approach each problem. You're you're given a set of facts, and you got to make the best you can out of that set of facts under whatever law that applies, and so. Hopefully, I've learned well <laughs> how to approach problems from a, a legal point of view, and, and remember at the same time, it's not all a legal application. You have to incorporate the human side of things as well, and do the right thing. In that regard, has you know the culture of Japan helped? Has that been a benefit in this? In your oh, no question, no question. Um, you know, learning another language and, and a culture opens your mind, uh, so mm-hmm. you become more open to other ways to approach things and, and doing things the right way. You know, doing the right thing transcends any language or any culture, so that's the beauty of doing the right thing. You're fluent in any language when you do that. Now, if I was... A young person like you were when your father asked you, what, what are you going to do next year? What would you tell him about uh, your experience? <laughs> what, what, what would you tell me if I was the young young guy that you were talking to? Uh, get educated. <laughs> Don't be dumb. <laughs> like me, I was lucky. Uh, you might not get as lucky as I was. Uh, just work hard and do well at whatever you're doing. I mean, that's a cliche, but Are the roads uh, that's what that it comes down to. I mean, uh, you'd, you'd recommend those roads, Japan study and military and law. Uh, all of those ideas seem to work out for you. Is that you'd tell a young person to think about them and maybe uh, investigate the same type of scholarships that you had? Uh, you know, is that something that uh, you, you'd recommend? Well, it worked out for me, um, but you know, you, you got to follow your own path and your own heart. If you know that, you're you're you've got a leg up. So, figure out what you want to do and be persistent. Well, don't give up. Yeah, that, that sounds like good advice. And also, you were uh, you you were kind of pointed in those directions too. There was some outside influences, I think. Somehow, uh, exactly. Uh, somehow yeah. And maybe pay attention to them. I guess is that is that something that folks should do? Pay young, young people should pay attention to these things that come out of the blue. I suppose uh, listening, <laughs> yeah, is a uh, is quite a skill that you have to develop. Yeah. Well, Steve, thank you very much for being my guest today. I, I, I like talking about all of these interesting roads, and uh, I have some of them in common. And. So it, it's, it's very f- fascinating to me. And thank you very much. Aloha.